All right. Our speaker today is the lovely Trace Saunders, who is a Charlotte native, married with children and grandchildren. He attended Charlotte schools, the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, CPCC, and Queens University. He studied law and served as an assistant district attorney, chief district court judge, and superior court judge prior to entering the private practice of law in the with the McNair Law Firm, a practice with offices in North and South Carolina. At present, he conducts a private dispute resolution and counseling law practice. He is also engaged in business brokerage and commercial real estate. He is an active, is active in the civic and professional affairs. So here is Chase Saunders. Yeah. Um, this is going to be wherever you'd like this. There it is. Let's see. Well, I can stand right here. Okay. Because that way I can. Perfect. Which slide needs to be shown? I'll get the slide going. And then can everybody uh, online or with screen across the speakers? Yes. It's, it's, it's a privilege to be here. I've spoken with Rotary, this Rotary Club over the course of 20 or 25 years in different locations. And the one thing that's always been consistent is you had the best food and best food you <laughs> And, and you, you've not let me down today. I didn't know this place existed. But the food is absolutely fantastic. And what you really have in terms of, of your future is a, a good location. I saw you've got some, uh, some chairs out there. They've got sort of a, a work uh, but enjoy yourself with this room in the back. And you really got an opportunity here to expand your membership. One way to do that is to contact the uh, ordinarily the young women who are managing all of these apartment complexes in this entire area. And uh, you've got lots of folks moving into Charlotte. You're a Charlotte resident if you've been here for two weeks. Uh, and, but one thing everybody, all Charlotte residents have in common is they don't know anybody anymore. And so the one thing, and the thing that's always, uh, basically how I spent my career, uh, and, and what I really appreciate about Rotary is that number one thing, is it the truth? That's the nastiest question you can ask on the human planet because it gets to the core of what reality is and, and how you can base relationships and how you can also assess the information you get and decide whether or not somebody's blowing smoke or whether or not they're telling you something upon which you can rely, which in the political season we understand is not something that's present to speak of. <laughs> but with the new people coming into town, not knowing anyone, the opportunity to have a relationship in an environment like this is really cool. Uh, is great. And so you've got a chance to get a lot of the young and the restless who are working in this area and, and get them to join uh, Rotary and, and your clubs like a family. And Rotary is a family. And when you're looking for relationships with people you can count on, Rotary is a place where, that, where the people who, who say those tests, and I love that five, <laughs> number five will be fun. You got a place to really create and cement relationships with people who are going to be around here a while. And we all know that Charlotte's a, a competitive place and um, it'll, it'll make or break you. But if you get along with, with uh, the vibe of this place and really enjoy it, then you'll develop a lot of relationships over the course of time. And Rotary Clubs are uh, a place to do that. Folks have their churches, but Rotary Club is a place where you're doing good in addition to meeting a lot of interesting people. And this location could be better. All right. Well, I think we have a new PIPR. Yeah. <laughs> what, what I see in here is I see these, these girls who I know are active in social media and have the connections and can use uh, use this as a vehicle for uh, leveraging and expanding uh, Try or your franchise, the Rotary message. Mm -hmm. uh, so what we're going to talk about today is history of Charlotte business, and this gives context for what I'm saying. We all remember about uh, Athens, which was called a city-state, and we hear city-states over the course of time. And, and what a city-state really is is a collection of people <laughs> who have an idea, and they start leveraging that idea, and they expand, and they're able to make it through the course of time uh, with, a, with a story uh, and a mission that's uh, Creates prosperity in the area, so they get a footnote in history. They can hit the next one. 
right, what I'm going to do is I'm going to I'm going to give you ten uh, ten year snapshots from the beginning up to the present along with the drivers of the economy. Uh, we started out as squatter town in the 1750s. Long about the 1750s, folks started coming in here. From uh, the Alexanders came in from uh, Eastern Virginia. You had some Germans who were coming out uh, down here, down the wagon road by way of uh, Philadelphia, which had the big port. <laughs> you had English who were coming down here. You had folks that uh, more uh, urbanized uh, areas up north were sending down here, like uh, Alexander Craighead, who they didn't like because he was a religious rabble rouser for the Presbyterians. <laughs> and, and, and they ended up in here. And the reason the 1750s were working was because all the, the Indians had, uh, down here had pretty well been wiped out in the 1730s by, by smallpox, which decimated most of those populations in the whole Western Hemisphere. And if you thought that the Native Americans who were here <clears throat> when we first met them were the first ones, the answer was no, because they had been parts of migrations that rolled in and exterminated the groups of Indians who had been here several hundred years before, and had been several of those. And the new DNA testing, if you're a fanatic on podcasting, you can find out what the DNA uh, tests are showing as to who who really is where and how they got to where they got. And, and so we started out a squatter town because uh, whatever the properties were that the current crop of Indians uh, had was decided by the Lord's proprietors and in England uh, was void and consequently you had to divide the town up and, and, and the state up and the colonies up and we had Lord's proprietors who were given big chunks of North and South Carolina. And uh, the the little Lord Fauntleroy, the, the, the guy who was representing the family who owned or had rights to this property, assuming they could extort rents from the people, uh, came in here and was seeking to uh, uh, get rents and profits from this land from the new settlers. That, and they had a little fuss fight over that and, and ultimately ended up with, uh, at some point, just avoiding their responsibilities. They tried to negotiate a deal. They had a little fight on one of these uh, uh, on Little Sugar Creek over the real estate part of this. And it was not settled too well, but primacy and possession is done in terms of the law. So the community did just fine because the people who were here uh, weren't going to pay anything, and they had to, they were going to make a living here, and they they did. Uh, by the 1760s, the money was along uh, the rivers where you had the arable land, and you also had along the rivers you had the transportation, which would ultimately get you down to Charleston, uh, and uh, also had. Uh, Shad runs. I mean, we had fish that were coming up here, and you could harvest those fish and, and live off of them. So the, the big plantations along the uh, the river were where uh, the money people were, and the other folks were associated along the creeks and wherever else you had arable land, and uh, that would have been d different spots. But it wasn't it wasn't Myers Park or South Park. That place was not uh, not arable. So by the 1760s, you had enough people here that they started talking about having uh, some identity. And you had some Rhine Line, uh, some Germans along the Rocky, Rocky River area, and then you had your Charlottians uh, who were along the river. And they met and decided that they needed to have a county seat because if you had a county seat, you got with some recognition from the crowd. And they created a Charlottetown named for the, the new Queen of England in order to hopefully get the crown to uh, approve their charter and um, call it Charlottetown and got a courthouse, and the courthouse was in the middle of Trade and Trine, Trade and Trine was mid-coast, uh, Piedmont, where at one point you had your animal trails going east and west, and then you had your Indian trails, and it was just a crossroads, and that's where they put uh, the courthouse. By, by 1775, you had a government, you had some court being held here, and you had uh, uh, a presence and, and some politics going on. You had a governor who had built Tryon Palace, for those of you familiar with Newman, Tryon Palace, it was a beautiful, expensive place and he was funding it with the money he was extracting from the Westerners, uh, particularly those in the, in the Chapel Hill and, and, and the RTP area. And they didn't like paying for that. And, and they were they created a group of people called regulators. And the regulators were local government people who said, we ain't gonna pay this and if you pay it, we'll burn you out and take your horses. And so uh, what we what happened in Charlotte is Charlotte was founded by a significant number of Presbyterian dissenters, uh, and they were basically corporate type people. In that particular church, uh, the community decides who's going to, they call a minister, the minister didn't call and dropped on. What uh, the, the English had was the Anglican system that was top down. 
you had the, the king, then you had the king's religion, and then you had the people who were part of the king's uh, religion, and it went to the local uh, vestryman who would ultimately report to the king on what was going on. And if you, you had to pay the, the vestryman uh, a tax in order to practice your religion or do anything, if you didn't do it, you could get locked up. So the folks here didn't like that uh, arrangement, and the regulators who were fighting uh, and not paying taxes about concerning uh, Newburn and the um, Crown Palace, the folks out here said, we'll, we'll cut a deal with you. Uh, we'll give you some troops and we'll help suppress those guys, but you got to give us a freedom of religion, leave those vestrymen off our backs, don't make us pay, let us marry uh, marry own folks and have our own schools. Uh, we don't want to do this, we don't want to do this Anglican thing. And so the governor said, I'll do that deal because I'm getting free military help to suppress these other guys. And we went up ahead in 17, in the early 17, well, 17, probably 74, 73. We went ahead and upheld our end of the bargain. Well, the governor then sends the, uh, the documents uh, confirming the deal to uh, parliament. And you can imagine what parliament basically did. They tore it up and said, you clowns, I mean, not Anglicans, I mean, you're there in the woods. So they said, no, no deal. And so all of a sudden you had folks here who were business oriented, who called their ministers, if they didn't like the ministers, they sent them away and, and were business people. And they said, well, we can't do business with these guys. And so in 1775, when the word came down to Lexington, the local uh, militia and the, the rest of the group uh, held a meeting at the, uh, the courthouse and basically declared their independence and said, we're out of here. And what they did is they created two documents, the Mech deck copy, which they can't find, the only extant in existence is, a cor is some corroborative evidence of what was seen in uh, New York and the actual words of the document, which were sent to, to uh, London and put in the London archives, uh, were not uh, favorable because they showed that Thomas Jefferson didn't do the first one completely. They were amazingly close. And there's a great book by D uh, David Fleming, who's written the whole story and he went into the British the British Library full of documents and there, there's a card where a particular individual who happened to be the ambassador to England from Virginia <laughs> checked out the only copy of the document that had the text of the Mac deck in it and disappeared it and that is on the records and Fleming's written this book <laughs> written this book about it but anyway so come 17th yeah, talks about his letters that's right. That's right. Well, Sam Adams said, uh, Jefferson, this sounds surprisingly like what you wrote. How come I didn't hear about it? The problem in North Carolina is copies went to the North Carolina folks, but they were basically Tories and they were Eastern North Carolina folk who didn't get along with us today in the legislature. And, and so by 1770, by 1775, we sent Captain Jack up there to declare our independence and did our own thing and set up our own corporate form of, of governance. So when 70 and 76 came out, I mean, we were already gone. Uh, we, uh, we were a trifling place, according to George Washington, when he came through. We had some military action when the Southern strategy, which took place in 1780, Cornwallis rolled in and was gonna separate the South and the North. They were in a stalemate in the North. What they wanted to do is slice the South, which was providing all of the, a lot of the food, and goods, a lot of them coming from Charlotte and heading up to Philadelphia. Now we were provisioning them and he wanted to cut that off. And so the, in 1780, 1781, there was a big fight going on in North and South Carolina and more battles were fought here than really were fought up North. And they tried to break us and they didn't. And there were little skirmishes, uh, they, there was cow pens, there was, <coughs> there was um, Kings Mountain, there was Guilford Courthouse, a number of these things, but ultimately as a result of, of not being able to succeed in this region, Cornwallis had to go to uh, resupply in uh, <clears throat> Virginia and game over when the French showed up and blocked, uh, blocked his, uh, the boats coming in. And so the, the town sort of rolled along, uh, growing people coming in over the course of time, but it really didn't get its launch until the 1830s and they discovered a gold and that gold was discovered uh, in the Reed Gold Mine in Cabarrus County, but it was also discovered all over this area. And there was a, it was a seven or eight pound uh, 
shiny rock that was found that a federal jeweler bought for a couple of bucks and took back the federal. And when the word got out that it was solid gold, the, uh, the folks up here were a, a bit upset at having been uh, skinned. And word got out and the gold mining started and there were, even after the Civil War, there was 300 gold mines and they were all where we are right now underneath the ground. And until the 1840s, we were the leading gold producer at a mint because of that in the United States. By the 1840s, he started getting uh, trains. There was a big movement at one point in time to have lots of uh, uh, canals, built canals, but they're hard to build. It was a lot easier to lay rail than it was a you know, ditch and put water in it. And so it became a train town. The cool thing was this, this is an entre entrepreneurial town. I mean, folks came up with ideas. We had some, uh, some merchants and they said, look, we gotta have some trade going on. We're so far from the coast, we don't have to use something to help us out. So they went to uh, that rich town, uh, Camden in South Carolina and said, how about coming come in on a, on a deal with us and subscribing to a railroad, you pay for some of it, we'll run from Camden up to Charlotte and we'll run it north. And, Cameron said, you guys are just back, backwoods folk. We don't get near you. We're uppity. And so they turned the deal down. There was this little town on the Congaree River. It said, sounds like a good deal to us. That was Columbia. And so the story was they were going to build a railroad. They built a railroad from Columbia to Charlotte. And then it was heading, going to head north to Danville. And then it was going to roll up Shenandoah and go up into like 77 and go up into Philadelphia, which is where all the money was and all the trade goods were. And Eastern North Carolina said, oh, we can't let that happen. And we had asked them to cut a deal and put a railroad, but they turned it down. When they heard that there was going to be another one, they said, oh, we'll connect you, the Weldon Railroad, connect you. And what was funny is when they, they built those railroads, you had different gauges, different gauges. So you had to offload the freight because it was coming in on, on a train with one site, one type of, of, of rail and leading on another. So they made sure that you couldn't run the business that was coming going north to south continuously, you had to put it on their railroad. So here are those kinds of fights today with data and the commercial carriers, et cetera. So that we had trains, we got trains. Then in the 1860s, uh, because of the trains, uh, when the Civil War started, all of the uh, munitions were being made in the uh, river cities and in, in the uh, cities on the ocean. The first thing Lincoln did was funded the blockade. And that meant the Confederacy didn't have any arms uh, manufacturing capabilities that weren't subject to bombardment. So they sent their, their military procurement and, and manufacturing zone group to Charlotte. These are the engineers, the guys that built the turb the, uh, the blockade runner machinery and built the uh, cannons and such. They were being built here because we had the railroad and that meant that the engineers Move the engineers up here into uh, 36th Street, that, uh, that area around uh, No Dock. And so they brought the engineers in here. So we got some engineers who came in here. And after the Civil War, we became a, a, a drummer town. We, had, we weren't burned out. It really wasn't a lot to burn out here. Uh, we weren't burned out, but we did have our manufacturing. And the town continued to grow. And we uh, started getting uh, merchants and people opening up the South. There's a funny story about that. There were we had lots of Confederate generals here, and, and one of the first Presbyterian church, or the old meeting house, uh, they were having communion one day, and one of the Confederate generals refused to serve uh, communion to the other Confederate general because he was trading with the Yankees. He was he was a, a New South guy. He wanted to make a, a, a buck, and that was not suitable. So he didn't serve in communion. So that guy went up and started Second Presbyterian Church. And Second Presbyterian Church ultimately ended up being Myers Park Presbyterian Church. But there are all these stories about this. So, so, but we had lots of folks who came in here because they could get their goods on a uh, coming in by train, and then they could take them out to all the surrounding areas and sell them. Then in the 1890s, we got uh, this. Uh, we became electric town. The guy, the richest guy in the country was James B. Duke, and he got it off of, of the cigarettes. And he was hanging out in New York uh, with J.P. Morgan. And J.P. Morgan had just taken the franchise for electricity that Tesla had given to George Westinghouse, and he ripped that off by a way of corporate takeover, and was building generators on Niagara to use that uh, new alternating current to power up with a new age and new electricity all in New York City, the Hudson Valley, et cetera. And that's when Buffalo was 
was a top drawer town on, uh, on Lake Erie. So electricity was the high tech uh, of the day. And it's still usually important. We're still fighting over it. So uh, James B. Duke was up there and he saw that and he was connected to families that were running mills off of uh, rivers. And that wasn't as efficient as running them off of uh, coal fired generators. And so they started bringing the generators down here and powering them uh, with electricity uh, coming from either coal or coming from the rivers. And that was the beginning of the textile industry. I'm about 19, so, so we were starting to bring electricity and that's when you had in South End, you had uh, the, the transits, or, or the trolleys that were put in the Charlotte to serve, to serve that Dilworth uh, development, which was outside in the county even though it was like half a mile from the center of the city. And then they also saw that uh, James B. Duke uh, Duke, uh, development called uh, Myers Park. So we've got electricity, uh, we've got the trains, we've got the drummers. Uh, come 1915, uh, with the war taking off, uh, the local business folks say, hey, we got to get some of that money we need to, how do we get that? And so they cut a deal to make Charlotte into a military base. And 60,000 soldiers showed up here. They built a military base in like months with 60,000 troopers. And this was over here, Camp Green on West Boulevard <laughs> and Wilkinson Boulevard. They built it in no time, 60,000 troops. This was 60,000, lots of horses. Remount Road is the where you went to take the horses to water in the creek and remount them and take them all back up. And, and so we shipped, we shipped all those uh, soldiers over there. But what happened in 1916, and the reason we're not federal because the other military base was in federal Fort Bragg. The reason that didn't happen to us is in 1916, uh, you had some horrible events take place. Number one, you had all the rain in the, in, in the place was absolutely a mud hole. And you had all these boys from all across the United States riding home to their mamas and daddies who wrote to congressmen saying, get our boys out of here. And so the uh, Congress said, we're gonna take it away from you. And on bended knee, we got to keep it. We were told we could keep it through the war. Now, one of the reasons that they got that military base, the locals had, in, had promised the government and the military was that Charlotte was a virtuous place where the boys would be safe from privation and from the hor horrible things and from, from drinking and carousing the court and the girls were virtuous and there wasn't gonna be anything happening. And my mom was 101, still, uh, still rolling. And uh, the, the girls who married some of those guys were, were identified in knowns, people who weren't from around here because everybody was distantly related. And, and had been for a long time because there wasn't anybody else to marry. Uh, but, but so, so when some of these new folks came in, they married them, and that uh, that was considered scandalous behavior. One, one of the fascinating things about it was the, the troops who came in to learn how to. These soldiers had to learn how to fight, fight in trenches, and they brought in a, a group of really uh, cool-looking guys, French Zouaves who had these like. Balloon blue pants and red capis and things, and they were really cool guys. And the group that came in to train these folks was called Le Blue Devils. And that's how that name got put up there <laughs> at that place called Duke. And so, so we survived. Uh, we, we survived a military base. And what that did is it brought in all of the supply chain. And because again, the railroads would bought the entire supply chain for any military base. That included every kind of manufacturing good to support that thing. The soldiers were getting like $10 a month. They had to send five from the mama and they had spent $5 here. And that was a lot of money coming in to, to Charlotte. So we got through uh, that war and start moving forward with the new technologies coming in. And new technologies include uh, uh, cars. We had a Ford plant on the uh, Statesville Road. And uh, we had trucks and things because again, there were textile community and you were bringing things in and moving things in all the time and cars and trucks were getting started. You had the efforts at the airport. Uh, the airport, which John Bill said, the reason it's there is that's where the planes are. 
the airport uh, had a number of little, there were little, a number of little places where you could fly a plane in and fly a plane out. One of them was Freedom Park. Uh, Rock and Bro was one of them. Uh, you had one on Freedom Drive. That was the most uh, prominent airport. And then they decided to put one out uh, on uh, uh, the current location and, and build it. And they put the word out to everybody to come on out there and, and build it. And they, they had this big celebration where a big airplane, it looked like a DC-3 biplane, flew in, but it couldn't land because they had built a runway too short. So it landed over here on Tuckasecia Road, Freedom Drive. And they then decided, uh, as, as time moves on, that they were going to apply for a WPA grant. So they built a bigger airport, uh, one that would support uh, the community. First Airwaves um, comes in in the 30s. And you had uh, some local local boys who got into this new high tech called radio, and they built a, a tower and got a franchise for a station. It was the largest broadcasting station you could. It would get all the way up to up to Maine in the evening, and they started broadcasting. Now, what that did is that made Charlotte a place where the new radio industry and entertainment industry was cranking up, and they were looking for content. Those boys came down here and said. Hey, you got any hillbillies? We want some hillbilly music to play up here in New York. And, and the station master who was running, making his money off of selling patent medicine pills said, hmm, yeah, we got one. He created a, a band, hillbilly band. And in the 20s, what happened is we had a recording industry and it was located on, on Drake Street, up on the second story of one of the buildings that's still there. And you had the, uh, the African-American musicians. You had uh, Bill Monroe, you had basically everybody in, in country music, everybody who was starting out music was recording here. And that was before there was Nashville, which sort of rolling up uh, mistakes that you can make as uh, Muhammad uh, Genetian well, was telling me that he'd gone out on one of these fact-finding uh, meetings with Chamber of Commerce out of And they'd gone to Nashville and after the meeting was over, the guy said, we'd like to invite you somewhere. We are just so grateful for what you people in Charlotte did. You taught us everything we needed to know about building a music industry, <laughs> which was rubbing it in. So, so we we left that, but still had the airwaves. So we, we had these logistics uh, means of communication and transportation here. And as a result of all that activity, we got a Federal Reserve branch, which was important because that meant we could, uh, we could move the transactions that all this money was based on. We got that here. And by the 1940s, the town was still a traveling place with a few 10 or 20, 30,000 people, not really big, but starts getting bigger with aviation and uh, they created Mars Field. And what happened was every the government was afraid that the Germans who were sinking all the ships off the East Coast were gonna be bombarding any uh, aviation centers along the coast. So they located them inland. So they called it, created Mars Field. They basically took that uh, little Charlotte airport and made it into Mars Field. They should have called it Sykes Field because he was a World War II, I mean, a World War I ace and got the Medal of Honor. And he was from Cabarrus County, but he wasn't a West Pointer. And so Morris got his name on it because he went to the right school. They put $5 million and created a big institution out there. and. You had basically the army, which had all of its planes in Europe. The Navy had its planes in the Pacific. Uh, it was a, a supply base. It was a training base. And uh, it, uh, it got us into uh, aviation at a, at a small level. By the 1950s, we were rocking and rolling because we had the transportation, the communication, the finance. We became the biggest uh, multi uh, purpose textiles town in the United States. We got the cotton, all the mills around here and, and all of these buildings around here supplied the mills. And they were not only just uh, producing the cotton, they were also producing finished goods. And they were producing the fabrics and such that were being used in Detroit. And all kinds of manufacturing was taking place here. And I can remember seeing a picture of, of one of the distant relatives, uh, far distant relatives, they had more money. It was a, a textile debutante. They had the Charlotte debutantes, who were the daughters of all the textile magnates on Life magazine on that cover in the 1950s. Now, that was, you wouldn't see that again. But that's when we were the leader in textiles. 
pre-NAFTA. Come the 1970s, we were sort of bumping along in the 50s and 60s, but inflation and offshoring and the world recovering from the war and getting manufacturing plants, we're just sort of floating around with no real stimulus. So at airport, 1979 is a big year. For those of you who may have participated, two things happened. One, everybody who had the chance who was in their 20s, 30s, 40s, or whatever, went out and stumped to get the boats to pass liquor by the drink so we could have bars with liquor. That's right, you were there too. And so that happened in the 70s because that meant that we could have businesses, business people come in and they could drink here instead of having to carry, have a, have a brown bag and have it checked in some bar around town here. And in the 79, they had the, the merger of uh, Piedmont Airlines with America. And so all of a sudden, uh, we had the, uh, the genesis for, uh, for growth. And at the, in the 70s uh, and 80s, as the banks were starting to, to grow uh, and reach out to folks from different areas, they needed to show that we weren't in the woods they need to have places, bars, and restaurants where people could come into as they flew in here to do business. And as a result of the bikes getting bigger, they needed to get some technology. And IBM moved in and verbatim and the outfits that were starting to make these things called computers that could allow you to do a lot of accounting instead of having a lot of people with those uh, hand-moved hand uh, accounting machines. Uh, and they were starting to come up with systems for doing it. And there were guys who were developing the software for that here, a um, guy named Broadway, uh, who was responsible for building the software. So by the 1980s, the computers start coming in, and Charlotte's full of entrepreneurs and business people. There were some bankers in this town who said, we really need to make some money. we got to merge. we got to have some interstate biking. And the banking law didn't allow any of that stuff going. So there was a, a young attorney who got on the banking committee and they changed one line in the banking act that allowed interstate banking to take place if you had some branch out there. And that guy came back to his position at NCNB and McCall then merged his Florida branch, separate branch, with this branch. Nobody objected to it. And the game was on, and the game was you acquired banks and you all ran them off of a central processing unit. Instead of having accounting departments everywhere, you did it off of one big computer. So you cut out all of all the accounting, all of the separate back offices and did that. So they started rocking and rolling, they roll the country. And then the guys that worked with them or got laid off, got moved out, they joined the first union which was called American Credit uh, back then. And so you had two voracious predators using high tech and consolidating and grabbing all the bikes. And that's how we got to be uh, buying tech. Uh, in the 1990s, we started getting the sports in here. And that's when you got the Panther Stadium. George Chen came in and got his, uh, got his basketball, right, right. And we started getting more sports activities and the, the energy associated with it. And of course, you then had NASCAR in there that was going all along uh, with two groups, Bruce Group and then the NASCAR family out of Florida. By 2010s, when we got hit by 2007, 2008, CDOs, CMOs, and all that sort of stuff, just cratered real estate market where it hurt everybody here. But what we started doing was moving into the logistics area with more focus. And by then, what we had in uh, 2010s is we had this virtual uh, cycle taking place of you had the internet had been created in 1990s. It was being levered uh, early on. You had the, the biggest thing that happened in our lives, which was Steve Jobs creates the iPhone and makes everybody a journalist and everybody an editor and everybody a photographer uh, with his platform. And that technology starts all coming together. And so we have all the components and they're all starting to lever off of that. And this area starts to grow. Well, the next iteration, and what's really gonna be a driver is uh, this, what I call Medtown. Went from Banktown, but Medtown's gonna be even bigger. 85% uh, of all the 
the money for medical research comes from the federal government. You can't get that if you're not a bank. Before we had a medical school, we we're getting a couple of million dollars. You're talking about three, four, five hundred million dollars coming in. You're talking about research and development. You're talking about the atrium, the Novant. The intellectual property that's being developed by the researchers allows them to have a sustainable platform because you get those patents and copyrights and you get to pull that money off. Eli Lilly, for those who got involved in that stock a couple of years ago, you're happy that's weak. That's Zepbound, which is the equivalent of, uh, of Ozempic, which uh, cuts your weight loss and does all kinds of miracle things, at least 20%. They're building a $2 billion plant up in Cabarrus County. We've got the North Carolina Research Institute, which does everything associated with nutrition, located in Kannapolis, where they're trying to figure out for the human genome, for the individual, what's the best uh, diet for them. So we have all the pieces put together to create a multi-billion dollar industry here uh, with none of the barriers associated with uh, existing institutions and the, uh, the friction or the institutions that have locked them down. So we get, to, we get to start something brand new. And when you add artificial intelligence into that, and there's $6 billion worth of service centers located up here on 321. You're looking at, at being able to take the logistics pieces, which is goods and services and stuff and money and people and IP and lever that up with the AI and, and what search is going to do. And all search is going to do is allow you ultimately, if you can ask the right question, to get access to all the information on the planet. And that's the race, uh, the race that's going on now involving Elon and Amazon and all the others. And the most recent development on that took place this week. Elon Musk announced that he has uh, opened up his Grok uh, search platform and is training it. Grok has all of the, has an endless supply of NVIDIA super chips and is going to hopefully, he wants it to have access to all the global information and be the biggest aggregator of information so that you can have the best searches on it, which means that Amazon ain't gonna be happy, Google ain't gonna be happy. Um, and Meta wants to get, Zuckerberg will get whatever uh, out of things. And so you're now seeing a war between those big guys to control all, all our information. So Charlotte, as we move forward, and the reason we're getting all these folks is all of those elements decade by decade have come together and created uh, what you're witnessing here and what you're feeling here, which is that we got a future and it looks pretty good, subject to the fact that there's nothing easy here. I mean, you gotta work real hard to maintain your place. So if you wanna hit, hit this next one. Oh, right. yeah, we've got about what, three more minutes? Yeah, I can. I, yeah, okay. This is, gonna, this is gonna be fast. Okay. All right, these are the economic development e ecosystems, CRBA, the city, you can keep this and send it around, CRBA, CCP, there are a number of entities that are part of the ecosystem of economic development that are here, and, and you can just you can forward this to okay. anybody who's interested. The guy who's doing the most is uh, Mohammed Genetian, and he runs the Hospitality and Tourist Association, of Hospitality and Tourist Alliance, and they have all the bars, hotels, they're everything touching with entertainment, people coming into town, he's behind that, and includes the development at the next one. Okay. Artificial intelligence, I mentioned, these are all the areas, basically everything will be affected by every entity in every institution. It's slow right now because people can't figure out how to ask the right question or what to do. And it's in the early stages, kind of like you can remember back in the day when they started creating apps. And now we've got apps everywhere. That's the beginning. Get the next one. Uh, Charlotte Trail of History, if you want to find out something about uh, Charlotte, and the, go to the charlottetrailofhistory.org. Uh, we put Captain Jack in there. Uh, Captain Jack was the guy that took the, uh, the Mac deck up to uh, Philadelphia. It's going to be a big celebration. The city's going to be celebrating the 250th anniversary of Charlotte's creation next year. And so uh, go to that website, uh, look for any details about that, because those are that's an event and something that you can put in your marketing materials and brag about. We were out first. <laughs> so get the next one. Uh, we installed uh, just most recently as part of each one of the bronze is representing a significant individual representative of a particular uh, type of industry. That's Linus McGlow, an internationally recognized uh, musician who was here, jazz musician. We installed a bronze to him, oh, three, four months ago. 
usual suspect. He's in every picture and every picture. Yeah. All right. Let's see. Is that ended? That's it. That's it. Got you in with the third.